in low light situations a bigger sensor has an advantage over a smaller sensor. But how significant is the difference in practice and does it really prevent you from getting the shot you want? I'd say it is about time for a thorough reality check. My name is Thomas Eisel, I'm a professional photographer from Vienna, Austria. In my career, I've worked with many different sensor sizes, from digital medium format to cameras with a two-thirds sensor. Of course, I've noticed that large sensor cameras handle low light better, but I've also noticed that I can shoot ultra low light with micro four thirds and get the images published without anyone ever complaining. So if you have ever considered getting a small sensor camera because of better portability and flexibility, but you've been held back by the notion that you might not get the shot in low light, then you should definitely continue watching. Also, if you are already shooting with a small sensor camera and thinking about getting a larger sensor camera for low light photography, you should definitely stay tuned as well. Let's get started. It might surprise you to hear that most low light scenarios are not an issue regardless of sensor size. Bold statement, yes. Unreasonable, definitely not. And here is why. Low light situations are only challenging when you need fast shutter speeds. If the photographic situation allows you to use slow shutter speeds, you can virtually use the lowest ISO setting of your camera every single time and still get the shot. Just use a tripod or rely on in-camera or in-lens stabilization. Of course, if the exposure times are very long, you might want to perform a dark frame subtraction either in camera if you have a model that is capable of doing so or in post production. Let me conclude with still subjects. Low light is almost never a problem, regardless of how small or old the sensor is that you are working with. Conversely, this means that we have to look at scenarios where freezing motion is required to get the shot. Then we have to overcome two challenges that we don't have to deal with when photographing still subjects. First, our cameras have to focus on a moving subject. And second, high ISO settings are needed to get fast enough shutter speeds to prevent motion blur. All in all, focusing on moving subjects in relative darkness is not different to focusing on moving subjects in bright daylight. Well, there might be one difference, and that is that usually you shoot with bright lenses wide open when there is not enough light. This means that we have to deal with very shallow depth of field and therefore the camera's AF system is put to the ultimate torture test as there is little to no room for error. You might already sense where I'm heading with this. But let's make things a bit more practical. Let me show you a great camera lens combo for low light photography. Here in front of me is my Nikon D800 full frame DSLR with the fantastic AFS Nikkor 105mm f1.4e. With it, I shot fashion shows and events in what can be considered absolute darkness. We are looking at three EV scenarios. Two things I'd like to share. First, in order to get fast enough shutter speeds, I had to shoot at f1.4 to f2 around ISO 6400 to 12800 all the time. The depth 
of field is ultra thin at these apertures. Second, to nail focus, even the face detection autofocus of a professional DSLR with its wide measuring base does not get every shot. This is more of a practical limitation, not a technical one, and there are many reasons for that. Erratic subject movement, slight camera movement, slight system latency, to name only a few. Combined, they result in the camera not getting every single shot perfectly in focus. And this has nothing to do with the D800 being an older camera. Every camera will miss from time to time under these circumstances. It is just the reality of it. So let's look at smaller sensor cameras. I've shot under the same circumstances with micro four thirds cameras, mostly with the OM1 and equally fast lenses. In terms of face detection, focusing accuracy, a mirrorless camera is at a disadvantage compared to a DSLR, as it uses a far smaller measuring base. Be that as it may, a micro four thirds camera needs only half the focal length to capture the same field of view as a full frame camera. This results in having double the depth of field compared to the D800 setup at the same aperture. The OM1, therefore, has more wiggle room to work with. This is an advantage that can lead to higher hit rates, especially under challenging circumstances. Another slight advantage of a smaller sensor camera when it comes to focusing has to do with optics. Lens elements of a smaller system that have to be moved around by focusing motors are significantly lighter. The difference can be quite obvious when shooting with medium format and everyone who did that sure noticed that those lenses tend to focus slower just because everything is so much heavier. All in all, I'm not suggesting that small sensor cameras have a major advantage when it comes to focusing, but it is safe to state that they are at least on par with their bigger counterparts. High ISO. Combine these two words and some small sensor shooters get nervous. Rightly so. Let's take a look. In general, what is the problem with high ISO numbers? It is actually the resulting image noise. And image noise comes mostly in two flavors. First, luminance noise, which results in a loss of detail, but can look quite organic and therefore acceptable. Second, color noise. We all know how color noise looks when zoomed in, but the real issue is that when there is too much color noise, the overall color of the image can shift. Usually, when color noise takes over, converting the file to monochrome is the only solution to the problem. I therefore consider color noise to be the real deal breaker of the two. Gladly, modern imaging pipelines and post-processing algorithms really help to mitigate the issue. The OM1, for example, controls color noise extremely well and can be used up to ISO 25600 without it taking over. In general, Using proprietary raw converters like OM Workspace, for example, can also really improve the noise performance, as those programs are tailor made by the camera manufacturer for their respective products. 
Now that we have talked about noise in general, it is worth examining where noise is mostly visible for the viewer. Dark areas are noisy areas. This problem can be somewhat mitigated by setting the black point. Apart from that, noise is also more discernible in out-of-focus areas. The wider depth of field that you get from a smaller sensor camera is therefore actually a small bonus. With all these things I just said, I do not want to give the impression that I am suggesting that the OM-1 delivers better high ISO images than the Pentax 645C medium format. It does not. But Micro Four Thirds, as the smallest professional grade camera system available today, handles high ISO situations a lot better than most people assume. Want to see some proof? Let's go back in time to 2014, when I shot a concert out of necessity with a Panasonic Lumix LX100 compact camera. This camera has a multi-aspect Micro Four Thirds sensor. Would I have gotten less noise with a Nikon D800? Yes, but for me, these images are good enough. Back then, they were even published in a book. So, for the last chapter, one big question remains. Is there really a practical limitation when using a small sensor camera in low light? I often wondered why it feels harder to get good results in extreme low-light situations with smaller sensor cameras. So I went through many low-light images I took over the years and I also examined the accompanying shot notes. I focused on those images that did not make the cut because they had too much noise or lacked overall fidelity for my taste, even after processing them. Here is what all these images had in common. They were not exposed as they should have been. Some were overexposed, some underexposed. Interestingly, images shot under the same circumstances but exposed correctly were completely usable. So now, it is quite obvious what the issue is. When shooting with high ISO numbers, the overall dynamic range and the high fidelity dynamic range any digital camera can record will decrease at some point. The relationship between ISO and dynamic range is not linear, at least not up to a certain point, but it exists. This means that every time when I messed up the exposure due to not paying enough attention, I ended up with a file that needed more adjustment in post-production. And while these files could be somewhat resurrected, they were not on par with their correctly exposed consecutive shots. So really, I messed up. It was not the fault of the small sensor, because the sensor was actually able to deliver sufficient high fidelity dynamic range. I just did not make use of it. When I was shooting with larger sensor cameras, the benefit of one or two stops more dynamic range just gave me more room for messing up and fixing it in post-production. This is the main reason why, on average, large sensor cameras feel easier to work with in low light. 
To conclude, the hard ISO limit of a large sensor camera is higher than the one of a smaller sensor camera. No doubt about it. Nonetheless, I am very confident to state that smaller sensor cameras are more than good enough to get the job done. What really ruins low light shots when working with small sensor cameras is not getting the exposure right. For example, by being too conservative with the ISO setting. Thanks to this revelation, I've developed a more attentive attitude towards exposure metering under all lighting circumstances, regardless of which camera system I am working with. I now treat digital sensors more like slide film, and this really paid off. I can only encourage you to do the same, because like with many things in life, what really limits you is not the size, but sloppy technique. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider subscribing and following me on other social media. See you next time.